good evening. There's news tonight that 100 sensitive government documents linked to the budget have been leaked to the Daily Mirror newspaper. The paper's editor says they've been handed back to the government. We'll have the latest on that in a few minutes' time. Well, earlier the Conservatives made a snap decision not to humiliate their Chancellor 24 hours ahead of his budget. And today in the Commons, the, ba the lack of public backbiting allowed Mr Clark to defend his view of single currency negotiations without embarrassment, and even occasionally to go on the attack. I welcome a debate. I actually... I enjoy the debate. And I think... <laughs> I think if the honourable the honourable gentleman's looking forward to having an interesting debate between me and my backbenchers, I think he'll have some fun with some of his backbenchers yeah. uh, if we ever get to a debate. Oh, and everybody, let me remind you: general election next week, our chance to change the government. On a somewhat smaller stage, we test views on tomorrow's budget among grassroots Tories who've turned their backs on the party. Where is the clamour for tax cuts everyone talks about? We ask a sceptic cheerleader and a long-time Euro enthusiast what tomorrow ought to bring and why their party seems to reach for the self-destruct button at the very mention of Europe. Uh, now we have this strike in France. It just uh, is one more nail in the coffin and for a small haulier we really are going to be suffering. Meanwhile, at the front line of European debate, French and British truck drivers are falling out with each other because of strike action. We ask a French driver to justify the actions of his compatriots and a British trucker whether, despite being a victim, he sympathises. And every word tells a Everyone story. Tough mind. talk by Labour whips may not have identified the MP who anonymously criticised Tony Blair in a left-wing paper. So we see if a more high-tech approach might come up with the offender's name. Kenneth Clark dispensed with some of his normal bluster, adopted the most conciliatory tone he could manage and got stuck into the legal detail as he answered questions on the single currency negotiations today. It seemed to do the trick. The fiercest interventions came from MPs on Labour's benches, while Mr Clark's own colleagues, among them John Redwood and Norman Lamont, did not deliver the knockout blows promised in the pre-match build-up. In fact, they barely even swung a punch. Europe, of course, was the subject, but what on earth was the object? Here's Mark Mardell. Well, this is what the government had fought a desperate battle to avoid. The Chancellor thrown into the lion's den to be questioned about three new Euro proposals. Why did they bother? Mr Clark, with his usual blokish panache, patted the beast on the head, stroked its mane, and then coolly jumped out again unscathed. But it would be wrong to think that no damage has been done to the government. Is the earliest occasion. For a start, Mr. Clark had to come to the Commons, and the splits were on full display. Growls of disapproval at one suggestion. Firstly, at some stage in the future, we might move to the third stage of EMU and adopt a single currency. As this government's always made clear, there could be advantages for this country in such a move. But the associated legislation on the details of EMU. <laughs> Well, but I... there was full-throated approval for the other option, Basically, the one Mr Clark isn't so keen on. Secondly, we might, we might always remain outside a single currency. Yeah. <laughs> it seems the Chancellor can only chortle when confronted with the reality of what his party is like. Many Tories are worried the Chancellor's leaving the pound in danger. A week today, there's a European finance minister's meeting, ECOFIN, and Eurosceptics believe Mr Clark couldn't care less about an ambush. They claim he might agree to strict new rules the British economy would have to follow even outside the single currency. Mr Clark promised he wouldn't, promised another debate before any agreement. What one cannot do is keep ringing up from ECOFIN at every stage of the negotiations and trying to get parliamentary cover. We must understand how we, we negotiate. I personally would rather that uh, other member states did not know at every stage exactly what I was pushing for, exactly what I was going to withdraw, what I really meant and what was a try on, and what I was actually trying to secure. And a process of parla permanent parliamentary debate, permanent parliamentary scrutiny, and occasional parliamentary hysteria is not always in the national interest. Eurosceptics were bothered that mainly pro-European Tories were called to speak, but even their mood was different from last week's seething anger. This, um, 
unnecessary row could have been resolved much earlier by the granting of a full debate about an issue which the uh, Prime Minister himself said is the most important decision facing the country. Many Tory MPs have a love-hate relationship with Mr Clark. They love Ken the Bruiser, who could win them the election with tomorrow's budget. They hate the man they're convinced is plotting to sell them down the river over Europe. It should have been the first Mr Clark who was in the spotlight this week. The pre-budget planning was all prepared. Last Wednesday, the softening up, accusations about Labour's spending plans. On Thursday, a Commons debate about Labour's windfall tax. But by Sunday, the carefully prepared pre-budget spin was knocked off the front pages by this row. Are the Eurosceptics proud of themselves? Was it worth the first? Yes, it was. It was a serious crisis. We have got a great deal uh, of agreement. We have got a debate. We have got scrutiny of the documents. We have got changes to the text to prove that it doesn't apply to Britain. And we have got Ken Clark agreeing to veto any attempt to fudge the entry requirements. That's a tremendous achievement for an afternoon. He's always most engaging and ebullient, and uh, you can't like, but, but like the man, and that's good because he's going to present a, uh, an election winning budget, we hope, uh, tomorrow. But nevertheless, these regulations can bind a successor parliament and successor governments. They are of immense importance, and to pretend otherwise is disingenuous. It was a barrister who specialises in European law, Martin Howe, who first alerted Eurosceptics to what he believes are big loopholes in the proposed Euro laws. He thinks they could mean real interference in the British economy. So is he satisfied with Mr Clark's assurances? Well, to some extent, but there's one point that still worries me, and that it seems to me that he is willing to go along uh, with the use of uh, economic monitoring powers in the treaty in order to impose compulsory obligation on all member states to submit economic plans and programs, so-called reinforced convergence programs. And the danger with that is once we accept that in principle, uh, we've given uh, the other member states the power to outvote us and impose obligations on us on the kinds of economic plans that we have to formulate and submit to the Commission. But we also sat down in front of the monitors a pro-European city economist and asked him if the MPs were right to get so worked up about these laws. Well, if Britain is going to be in EMU, then it is very serious. They should discuss it. If we're not going to be in, it doesn't um, have all that much effect on the UK at all. No effect? I don't see any particular effect. After all, membership in the ERM2 is, is voluntary. No question about that. And the stability pact, we won't, that won't apply to us. Uh, we will continue to submit uh, convergence programmes, as we have been doing for the past two years, uh, to show that our public finances are on, on a sound path. The House will get the chance to argue this subtle difference in a two-day debate, either next week or the week after. Details aside, the government has been damaged. Yet again, after saying all last week there'd be no statement, today there was a statement. Most MPs blame the whips, but it's confirmed the Eurosceptics in their belief that if you hit Mr Major hard enough, for long enough, he'll cave in. Jeremy? Well, thank you very much. Extraordinary development on the eve of the budget. The Mirror newspaper has said it's received 100 pages of Whitehall documents linked to the budget and detailing tax changes. The newspaper said it passed them back to the government, saying stock market chaos could result if the details were printed in advance. Mark, how serious is that? It, it is extremely serious. Obviously, governments of all kinds get used to all sorts of leaks that happen from departments. But budget is guarded very carefully. Uh, Mr. Clark abandoned a tradition of going into what they called purder, not saying anything while he was running up to the budget. He, like today, made a statement. But it is extremely serious to have a budget leak, especially something like this, which, if it's true, appears to be page after page after page, not, not just a, a couple of hints. Is there any precedent for it? Uh, not, not of a leak on this scale, if it really has happened, but something that did happen in 1947, that then-Chancellor Hugh Dalton uh, told a journalist on his way to the Commons to make the statement, uh, 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 one or two details, and that got in their late editions, and, uh, or, uh, and, and before his budget, and he actually resigned over that. So it's something that parliamentarians take exceptionally seriously. Oh, well, thank you very much indeed. We're joined by John Redwood and Tim Renton now. Mr Redwood, you're a sceptic, of course. Mr Redwood, what you, we don't yet know what was in these budget documents handed to the Mirror, partly because they've given them back, but what would you like to see in them? Well, I'd like to see in the budget a penny off income tax. Uh, I'd like to see enough increases in public spending to do a good job on health and education and law and order, but a lower rate of increase than are in the current plans. I think we could do with a bit less than the 13,500 million increase 
they are currently forecasting. On the, on the, and the, I'd the, like to see help for families and help for the unemployed through a package to attract small businesses to recruit them. On the uh, question of the debate today, which you, mm. you spearheaded uh, the Eurosceptics in, uh, did you see it as a cave-in by the government? Well, I didn't accept your analysis of the situation. Conservative MPs are not trying to hound a Conservative government out of office. I welcome very much the fact that we did get our opportunity to cross-examine the Chancellor. We are getting an extended debate. He has promised that he will not commit us to anything at the Finance Minister's meeting. And above all, I welcome his promise that he will try and improve the texts of these regulations to make it crystal clear that they won't apply to us unless we want them uh, to apply to us. Well, do you very, act... very important progress. Just before, we go, before we go to Mr Renton, do you accept that the conservative costing of, of Labour's policies, which was supposed to be the big news event last week, has been totally overshadowed? The budget's been upstaged, Mr Clark has been embarrassed, and perhaps so has the Prime Minister, and all for what? Well, very important progress. We've now had proper scrutiny uh, of the Chancellor's arguments. We need to complete the scrutiny of the documents and have our debate. And we've also cleared up the issue of whether the Chancellor wants these things to apply to us or not. So I think that is most important. It would have been better if it had been done a week ago, but it wasn't, so I welcome the fact that it was done today. And we haven't crowded out all the other stories. You are mentioning the costing of Labour's programme, and that received a lot of coverage, and rightly so, because Labour remain the high-spend, high-tax right. party. Tiberenton, do you regret the manner in which this whole issue simmered up and, uh, to a climax in today's debate? I think it's pretty typical of the House of Commons. I mean, the fact of the matter is that committees do get very worked up about how, they're, how the things that they're looking at are going to be examined in the full House, and that's what happened on Thursday and Friday. In fact, I agree with John Redwood. I think it is a good thing that we had this mini-debate today and where I think there was a real change of mood in the House this afternoon is that on both sides of the House, but particularly ours, there is now a greater acceptance that EMU is likely to happen. And what we've got to learn is how to live with it, how to live with it in British interest. Is that right, John Redwood? Well, I don't think I'd quite put it like that, but um, I'm quite sure that France and Germany are determined to go ahead with monetary union. I do want Britain to have a bigger influence on whether it happens and how it might happen. Uh, because even with us outside it, it is most important that we don't let them go ahead with a scheme that doesn't work and damages their economies. Mr Renton, there is this sense shown in, in proceedings this week and last that I I if someone puts their finger on the button marked Europe, your party tends to go haywire. <laughs> well, you used that phrase before, Jeremy, and I, I don't think that's right. Uh, Labour, for example, all Gordon Brown did today was he gave no in incidents at all of where Labour would stand on this issue, he decides to see how many Labour MPs he can keep dancing on the point of a pin without knowing in which direction they're going. This was important to have this mini-debate before the meeting of finance ministers next week. Ken Clark made it absolutely plain that the stability pact, as it's called, which will govern the deficits of those countries that join the single currency, as long as we're out of it, it will not apply to us. But we, and this is perhaps one of the most important points made in the debate by one member of parliament, don't let us think that it'll be in our interest to hurt EMU, to make it not work, because it won't. Because our trading interests with common market European Union countries are so large now, 60% of all our exports in manufactured goods are going there, that if there are downturns in the European market because EMU isn't working well, then it is British manufacturers who are going to feel the pain. So, and that was a point that kept on coming over this afternoon. So, Mr Redwood, this two-day debate that is coming up, not before Ecofin on the second, but at least before the main Dublin summit, is this going to be a, a famous victory for Euroscepticism? What, what's it for, this debate? Well, the debate is not to establish victors in the way you described. The, the debate is there so that we can have some influence over our government's negotiating position at this crucial meeting. They are going to make decisions which could have an impact on the way that the British and other economies are run for decades ahead. Very, very big decisions indeed, bigger than any decision being taken tomorrow in the budget. The so of course we want a decent long debate and we want to feel that the government is listening to our points of view. On the specific question that you were talking about today with Mr Clark, the, this business of actually trying mm. to prevent Britain being penalised if it mm. if it's out, stays outside monetary mm. union, isn't that the kind of thing you could have settled by just having a word with the Chancellor in a Commons corridor? Well, I didn't succeed in settling it by having a word in a Commons corridor, so it was very sensible to have exchanges on the floor of the House, and it worked very well. The Chancellor has said he doesn't want it to apply to us either, the Prime Minister has said that, and he's now agreed with me that maybe the text needs improving 
Otherwise, we could get caught. Mr. Renton, looking at this as a former chief whip, it's not been particularly well handled, has it? I think any chief whip, uh, starting from Willie Whitelaw onwards, uh, would at some stage have said, well, if they're making that amount of fuss in a committee, to be blunt, let's have a two-day debate on it, and we'll flash it out on the floor of the House. And that's the stage we've got to. But I don't it... think it's too bad that there was this mini-debate today. I think John Redwood was being a bit naive, his answer, just then. Of course, it's perfectly clear from the Treaty of Maastricht that the conditions of the Stability Pact wouldn't apply to the countries that don't join. EMU stage three. It didn't need the debate to make that no. clear. But what it has done is it's got a very firm view of what Ken Clark is going to be discussing at the ECOFIN me meeting next week. There will then be a big debate, a two-day debate before the Dublin summit. And I hope that this will give John Major a very clear okay. sense of strength at the conference to come. All right, Mr. Redwood, Mr. Redwood, thank you both very much indeed. Now back to the reported leaking of those budget papers to the Daily Mirror. There's been no statement from Downing Street as yet, but we have the Mirror's editor, Piers Morgan, on the line. Uh, Mr Morgan, you're sure that these were documents that related to the budget? I was very, very sure, thank you, yes. What did they actually... Well, I don't want to know what they say because you're not printing them tomorrow, but, but you presumably decided instantly to hand them back for, for what reason? Well, not instantly. We gave it very careful thought because we had a very substantial part of what Mr Clark was going to say tomorrow. And on the face of it, it was a great scoop to simply run everything that he was going to say. Um, but after more thought, we decided it would be rather more responsible to hand it back, because obviously the implications, had we come out with all this in the morning, could have been very far-reaching. Well, what precisely? Well, I think you can draw your own conclusions, but if we were going to start revealing the rate of income tax six hours before the Chancellor, I think we can all draw our own conclusions. So this was, was this the actual text of the speech, or, or was, it, was it background briefing that you got? No, these were um, in the main press releases, which would be issued at the end of the speech on every individual point. Do you know where the documents came from, roughly? I don't want to go into that. Were they faxed to you? I don't want to comment on that. This is fairly unprecedented, isn't it? Do you know why the person chose the mirror? I think it would be fairly obvious why they chose the mirror. If you were going to embarrass the government, we are a perfect receptacle. And if anybody else out there has sensitive government documents, we are on the market. Mr Morgan, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, the budget will bring Mr Clark back into the Commons and the government will hope disaffected Tories back into the party. A by-election is pending in Wirral South, formerly a Conservative seat, so Newsnight has been testing expectations among doubting Conservative voters there. Peter Marshall reports. Oh, Pines, that colour's working well. First prize again. That's no stoppers. Oh, and everybody let me remind you, general election next week, our chance to change the government. Well, the election isn't next week, but certainly it'll be soon enough. In the latest production, a bright and bold design, the art of the Riverside players anticipates reality. I'm not supposed to talk about politics on the premises. In real life, a good number of the group are political conservatives. And when people like these start to grumble, the government would be wise to listen. What were all that about? I think it were an offer. I'm a conservative, born and bred, as they say. But I still think that they've made a lot of mistakes. And I really can't see where they're going at the moment. And hers isn't the only voice of dissent. Where are the Conservatives, their Conservatives, taking them and Tory Wirral South? To me, politics is a private and personal matter. With the budget tomorrow, they're hoping for some decent, readable signposts. I'm not terribly happy with them at the moment. As far as things like education, I have a young family, so I'm hoping they're not going to alter things like family allowance. Um, I don't want them to to see VAC on children's clothes, things like that. Um, in fact, I'd like to see the VAT rate lowered. I'd like to see uh, money for more teachers, many more teachers. I am a retired teacher myself, and how teachers are coping at the moment, I really don't know. And law and order. In the main, Wirral South is comfortable, fundamentally conservative suburbia. What's significant about the constituency now is that it could soon be the scene for a by-election. That would pass judgment on tomorrow's budget while pointing the way to the general election. So for a government defending an 8,000 majority here, pleasing the people of Wirral South suddenly looks crucial. Hello. Hello. Mike Williams has been running his computer parts business since John Major's victory of 1992. It's been tough, but he's survived and supports four children on the proceeds. 
Yet Mike Williams, hitherto always a Tory, isn't happy with the government. It's not that he wants more in his pocket, he wants investment in the nation. I don't want to see any tax cuts. Uh, I reckon that any money they take on the tax cut is going to be taken from somewhere else. Uh, so I would prefer that the money was actually put into education and health. Um, and that's, that's the main benefit for me. On, on the business side, uh, I suppose I can't currently afford things like um, private health care. So that's a major factor for me with the health service. If I go off ill, what can I do? This is also a place with a higher than average proportion of elderly. One in five is a pensioner. Here again, there's dissatisfaction with the Conservatives. This is that new Brighton. Edith Watson has always supported them, but now she's wavering. It's been a dreadful 12 months for Mrs Watson. She lost her husband and could do without the nagging financial concerns. I were been um, on the home help at the um, council for 14 years. And and then I had a, an accident, who injured my hip, left hip, which um, I had a pension. So of um, April this year, I think it was, Mr Lilly said that £30 had to come off it, which left it with nine ninety. So between my pension and the £9.90 is what I have to live on. Um, I think to myself, through no fault of mine, I had that pension taken away from me. Um, you know, and this is what hurts me with the government. I've done my work, but they don't seem to be doing their work. From Edith Watson and all those unhappy Tories who spoke to Newsnight, there's a warning for the government and Ken Clark. This could be the last chance to please their own core support. People who want to vote Conservative, who normally do so by instinct, but won't next time unless they get the budget they want. I'd like to read in the papers something, you know, that they're going to do something for us. We've done a uh, little bit for the country in our younger days and in our older days, but um, they don't seem to be treating us right. That report from Peter Marshall. Tim Renton is uh, still with us. Mr Renton, are you going to be able to give people like that woman what they want? I hope so. Uh, I don't know the secrets of the budget. I know less about them, apparently, than the, someone at the Daily Mirror does. But it's very natural for everyone, like those you were talking to, like Edith Watson in particular, should want to see something in the budget that helps them. It's interesting, uh, it's absolutely wrong. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, that people are, are, are not... When you, when you go out on the streets and you record interviews like that, you do not hear the clamour for tax cuts yes, that I, one has heard so often from your colleagues. Yes, I, I agree with that. And my personal wish would be to see that there would be some improved tax allowance for carers in the budget uh, tomorrow, because I think they do do an awful lot uh, to help, and I think that there is a possibility of improving their tax position. But that said, I would my also like to see a, a widening of the band of those who pay tax at only 20%, and a lifting of the level at which paying income tax starts, because personally I'd like to see help concentrated on those at the lower end of the income scale, and I think that would help some of those who were talking from West Wirral. Mr. Renner, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Not for the first time, French lorry drivers have stopped driving and started parking in the most inconvenient places. And tonight their protest against pay and conditions is threatening to escalate into Euro gridlock. The lorry terminal at Calais has been sealed off to goods vehicles, forcing freight to switch to Zeebrugge. Instead, the port of La Rochelle is closed too, leaving only Cherbourg and Saint-Malo still open. French drivers have blocked the five main crossing points into Germany and at the clermont ferrand spaghetti junction there's a particularly bad bottleneck. In Toulouse they're even running out of diesel and unleaded petrol. We're joined now by our correspondent, uh, Paris correspondent Kevin Connolly from Calais. Uh, Kevin, what is the latest in the situation there? Well, on a day when the mood of British drivers here has gone through every shade of dis discontent from boredom to anger to frustration, very little in truth has changed on the ground. The port of Calais, as you said, is still blockaded. The roads leading to it are choked by parked French lorries. There's no sign that they're going to move. The French strikers say that nothing is going to change until they get what they want from talks in Paris, earlier retirement and higher pay. The latest we hear from Paris is that, in truth, there's very little sign that that is likely to happen. What's the problem with the negotiations? I think, very simply, the bitterness in all this runs back to the last truck driver's dispute here four years ago. 
The truck drivers then feel that they were made promises that weren't kept. And what you're seeing now is the pent-up bitterness left over from that dispute. They say they're determined to keep going, as I say, until they get what they want. And there's very little sign that the employers, in spite of the uh, intervention of the French government, is going to give way. So what about the role of uh, British drivers in this, Kevin? Because we, we gather that earlier on they were blockading ferries going out of France. Uh, are they planning to resume that tonight? Well, there is still talk of that, of course, but the British driver's uh, action in blocking briefly the ramps leading to the ferries was very much a reaction to the failure here of the French authorities to clear the port of Calais. There's a sense that the French police, if you like, are more concerned with maintaining order than with breaking the blockade. And so, in a sense, they are helping the French uh, strikers to keep the British lorry drivers helpless victims here, caught in the middle of someone else's strike. Kevin Connolly in Calais, thank you very much indeed. Many of the haulage businesses in Britain are small concerns. Typical is the JA Group in Rochester. Lorraine Todd, their transport manager, gave us her view from Kent. Um, yes, could I speak to Carlos, please? You can't get out at all. Right, well, what's the situation like with the diesel in the fridge? Yeah. If we lose the consignment of lambs as well, it's going to cost us an awful lot more money than what we're already losing. I'm very angry um, with the way that the French always seem to be able to stage this sort of demonstration um, because at the end of the day, the only person that really suffers is the haulier. It wouldn't happen here in the UK. We never, ever block the roads, but any little problem that the French have is, is their first um, answer is to block their roads. Each vehicle has to earn £2,500 a week. Um, with our driver being stuck in Khan for six days, he's obviously not earned any money. Um, with another vehicle going out there, if that vehicle gets stuck, again, we're not going to be earning any money. That's £5,000. I understand that we're entitled to compensation. Um, I haven't been notified on where I can claim this compensation yet. Um, and if I do, how long is this going to take? We need something sorted now. I'm losing money now. The problem we face with the beef crisis this year, plus obviously this week with the tunnel being closed, because that affects us with our time deliveries. Uh, now we have this strike in France. It just uh, is one more nail in the coffin, and for a small haulier, we really are going to be suffering. We're joined now by uh, two participants in the dispute, by René Valadon, a senior, senior official with uh, Force Ouvrière, one of five French unions involved in the dispute, and also by Neil Harvey, who's the driver for MFL uh, Transport in Newcastle. Mr Valadon, first of all, the, 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 uh, our interviewee with there was saying that the first answer you seem to come up with is to form these blockades. Is that fair? Um, I don't know really uh, the situation of Calais. Uh, what I can say... Well, it's blocked in it, Calais. Yeah, what I can say. Uh, we give orders uh, and we want that uh, foreign truckers and especially uh, British drivers uh, can uh, go through the barriers. But they can't go through? Yes. It, it is impossible for me to uh, assure that all these orders are respected by uh, the strikers, but uh, all the unions gave orders for uh, foreign uh, drivers. All right, well, let's talk to our British truck driver, Neil Harvey. Apparently, orders have been given yep. to allow you through. Yeah. Oh, we, we can go through. We, we've just yeah. had it on the air, chaps, we can go through. They haven't been stopping us. Well, that's the biggest lie I've ever heard. We just fought to get two out going, uh, that are on the way back to the UK. And they've been arrested by the police, so the police are showing which way they're, which, which side their bread's buttered on, like by arresting English wagon drivers who are getting onto the boat. Mr Valadon, did you hear that? Apparently the British trucks at Calais are not being allowed through. Is there anything you could do to, to get them through? I don't know as exactly the situation in Calais. Uh, I don't know if uh, the ferries uh, are able uh, to, uh, to, to go to Calais. Uh, I don't know if uh, PNO, for example, is not going to Zeebrugge. Uh, but uh, we have more than 160 barriers, and it is very difficult for everybody to know exactly the situation okay. in, on all of the barriers. Let's, let's focus on, on, on what you do know then. Uh, are, you going, are you making any progress in your negotiations? Oh, I can uh, answer now, because uh, bargaining, the negotiation uh, uh, began at uh, 8 o'clock French time. 
Um, but uh, we hope, everybody in France hope that the negotiation uh, can have a result. Um, we can't, n nobody want to have uh, a strike too long. We have also a problem in France and uh, that it is not really a good situation for everybody in Mr. France. Harvey? It is very hard well, for us. Just a moment, Mr. Harvey, what do you make of that? And, and, and tell us, while, while you're uh, answering to what you, you just... I heard you shaking your head out, Mr. Valadon was saying, you, you've, of course, made doing your own blockade down well, there, there's, aren't there's you? Not one, there's not one vehicle gone out of here today. We're not blockading ourselves. There, there's not one vehicle gone out. They've got concrete bollards across the road, wagons parked across the road. Nothing can get in or out. And if you try to go in or out, the police are stopping you and you can't get past the obstructions are anyway. You, are you going to resume your blockade of the ferries tonight? I don't know. Well, Mr. Mr. No, Mr. that's Harley. nothing to do with me, yeah? Yes? That, I say that's no, nothing to do with me. Are British it's... trucks likely to be blocking off the ferries tonight, Mr Possibly. Harley? Possibly. Do you think they've got just uh, cause to do that? Yes, I think we have. But at least uh, today, blocking them has got, actually got the government and the uh, people in the unions talking to each other. Because they haven't been talking to each other and they weren't supposed to meet until tonight, but they did speak this afternoon. So we did get something moving. What would you say to but Mr. What he's saying? What would you say what to Mr. Valadon? What are you about vehicles being able to go in and out? There's nothing gone in or out. Mr. Valadon, can you give give Mr. Harvey there any idea of the time scale involved in these negotiations? How quickly you think they'll be resolved? We hope that this uh, negotiation must be have a, must have a result uh, this night. Uh, it is quite uh, very, it is very dangerous for all the economic situation in France also to have a strike uh, who, uh, which is going on uh, too long. Uh, we would like to have very quickly result, but our main problem is to have an organization of employers uh, which be, will be able to discuss to bargain, and we have not a very good uh, organization of employers. Okay, Mr. Harvey, you don't look hopeful. Mr. Harvey, you don't look hopeful. I love you. I'm not. I'm not. What he's been saying makes not two words of sense to us. All we want to know is what time we're going to be moving from here. OK. Uh, he's saying we can move now, so we'll all go and get in our wagons and go. I don't think we're going to get that precise an answer tonight. Mr. Harvey, Mr. Van. No, do I, because the, the riot... The riot police have just moved in. As I came round the corner to the camera, they moved the riot police in round by the, where our wagons are. Thank you both very much indeed. In a moment, two computer experts try to unmask the Labour columnist, Cassandra. But first, some of today's other news stories. A daughter of the former Northern Ireland MP, Bernadette Michalski, is facing extradition to Germany. The German authorities want to question Roisin Michalski in connection with the IRA mortar bomb attack on the British army barracks at Osnabrück last June. Now back to the reported leaking of those 36 budget papers to the Daily Mirror. Downing Street have still issued no statement, but one can safely assume a full leak inquiry is underway. As we heard earlier, there's been nothing comparable since 1947, when the then Chancellor Hugh Dalton spoke to a journalist half an hour before his Commons speech and had to resign. His Prime Minister, Clement Attlee, called him a perfect ass at the time. Short time ago, the Mirror's editor, Piers Morgan, told us he handed the documents back because of their extreme market sensitivity. He wouldn't comment on the possible source of tonight's leak. While the Chancellor kept his place today as one of the most brightly spotlit politicians at Westminster, another face has resolutely stayed in the dark. Whichever Labour MP it was who dripped anonymous poison on Tony Blair from below the masthead of the left-wing Tribune paper, he or she is in no mood to own up. Under the resurrected byline Cassandra, the article suggested Mr Blair was despised by his colleagues and might even be replaced by Robin Cook. Newsnight has had the writing style analysed by experts in Bristol who use the same computer system that outed Joe Klein of Newsweek as the author of Primary Colours, the novel that was not kind to Bill Clinton. And our experts think they know who Cassandra might be. So, what do we know about this Cassandra fellow? Something about the use of language. Yeah, the way he puts sentences together, the way he uses words. It's distinctive, ungrammatical, very lacking in grammar. Doesn't really narrow the field, does it? 
Has it really only been 10 days since Labour insiders started trying to piece together the identity of Cassandra? Whoever wrote the Tribune article must have felt time was passing rather slowly as the uproar built and the world wanted the name of the writer who said Tony Blair was so unpopular he could be switched with Robin Cook as soon as Labour took power. At Party HQ, the official line is, this is tedious and trivial. But the scores of racy news stories that Cassandra has spawned don't look that trivial with an election looming. And left-wingers are in no doubt the writer would lose the party whip if caught. The editor of Tribune is sworn to secrecy. His mystery contributor was taking no chances. I think the individual was worried about losing the whip. Uh, and, of course, we now know that if the individual should be uncovered, um, that's exactly what would happen. Uh, and there's, there's obviously no doubt that in the run-up to the election, the, the spin doctors of all the parties are policing the troops, uh, trying to ensure that nobody steps out of line and nobody says anything controversial and perhaps nobody says anything particularly interesting. Uh, but that's, that's, that was the fear. Uh, and th this individual stipulated that he or she should be referred to as a senior Labour MP. The editor's not talking, so who will? The suspects are all talking. Yeah. Everyone. They're all denying it. The suspects, whose identities have been conjured with by Labour insiders, include the left-wingers Brian Sedgmore, Denzel Davis, Ken Livingston, Peter Hayne, Anne Cluid, John Garrett, and even the unlikely Roy Hattersley, hardly left-wing. So Newsnight asked two experts to analyse what they'd written in the past and look for echoes of Cassandra. They worked for three days, pausing only for regular meals, short breaks and trips home to sleep. We thought it'd be nice to have a multiple line of attack, so we actually used four different methods to assess a kind of linguistic match between Cassandra text and the other candidate text that you supplied us with. The easiest way is to think of it as analogous to a fingerprint. Um, we all know that we can identify people with fingerprints. Well, the way people use words is also uh, characteristic of themselves, and, and it's a word print. So we can use word prints to uh, identify writers. The pair analysed recurring verbs, nouns, and even groups of letters. They look at the point being made by each paragraph. What turns out to be crucial is the analysis, not of unusual words, but very common ones. Key words, including but and so, were logged and counted. We are leaning towards author F as the most uh, likely author of the sample we've seen, anyway, for Cassandra. In the case of primary colours, the anonymous insider view of the Clinton team, F turned out to stand for Joe Klein of Newsweek. The same analysis technique was used. And after initially saying he wasn't the author, Mr Klein then had to backtrack. Who is F? F apparently is Ken Livingston. Mr Livingston tonight denied being the author and said it was most unlikely he'd write a critical piece anonymously when he put his name to plenty of them. So will we be hearing more from Cassandra? Well, we may, we may hear a little more from Cassandra. Um, it may not necessarily be the same Cassandra, uh, but uh, I think uh, any Cassandra would tell you that the reason that they do this sort of thing is that, they're, that, that, that these sorts of views aren't being taken up by the mainstream press. Um, and if they've got something really controversial to say, and there's constant fear of disciplinary action being taken against them, that's the only way to do it. Joined now by Ian Hargreaves, who edits the New States. Mr Hargreaves, does this matter very much? Well, not enormously, I don't think, but it's quite good fun. Um, although not for the um, perpetrator if caught, because they could lose the whip, and if they lost the whip, wouldn't be able to stand at the next election. So it's serious to that extent. I suppose the thirst for information on this person is, in a strange way, a tribute to the effectiveness of the Labour machine in disciplining so many people and keeping them from saying things like this. Yeah, well, a number of people were warned in the uh, schisms and controversies that attended the shadow cabinet elections in the summer, and there are a couple of people out there on yellow cards already. One of them is Ken Livingston, I think. And this would be a red for him? Uh, I think it would, yes, although I think Ken's defence that he said uh, all of this uh, with his name at the bottom of the article many times before is a pretty good defence. Is there a history of, of anonymous uh, articles in this kind of context? Long and distinguished one. Uh, great English radical Thomas Paine uh, signed a lot of his articles Common Sense and helped to foment a couple of revolutions, one in France and one in America. Well, the key question is whether it's, it's healthy for, for Labour to have this going on, because presumably people talk about invasion of the body snatchers and everything if everybody parrots from the same hymn sheet. Yeah, well, it does be become a bit wearing for the rest of us. One can understand why the leadership's nervous and wants discipline. That's in their interest. It's perfectly understandable. But politics
politics is a pretty dull thing if you can't have people expressing the sort of views that uh, Cassandra is rather fatuously, I think, expressing. But nonetheless, let's have a bit more of that kind of fatuity. Would you print Cassandra if you were approached by, on the phone maybe, by a voice you half recognise? A secret voice, Cassandra. No, I don't think that we don't take things from Tribune. We regard them as being a bit too down market for us. What about the idea of this loyalty oath that Labour have been, some people in Labour have been talking about, the idea that actually there could be some formalised procedure whereby an M MPs would have to maybe even sign something that says if, if you d are too disruptive then you face certain penalties and then after they are the organisers can say, well, you knew what was coming. Well, it's true that Labour uh, is considering looking at drafting some new disciplinary code for its members. That won't stick if it doesn't have the agreement of the membership broadly, the Parliamentary Labour Party. And I think it would be very easy for the Labour leadership to push this sort of thing too far. On the other hand, you know, look at what's been going on in the Conservative Party. Uh, nobody buttons their lip there. And as a result, you get the kind of uh, tactical chaos that we've had from that party in the last week. Ian Hargreaves, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Before we go, we have notice of what's preoccupying tomorrow morning's papers. And uh, the Daily Mirror, which uh, had got details of the budget, actually leads on uh, loving the We Love Q Fergie uh, as their front page, and that's nothing to do with the budget at all. International Herald uh, Tribune, uh, Beijing's panda stymies uh, Clinton. And uh, the Clark, Clark uh, Times, Clark takes the steam out of Euro, Rao is their lead. Uh, Financial Times, again, Clark heads off Tor Tory revolt there and uh, queuing up uh, the Budget 96 preparations. Clark claims tactical victory in that debate on Europe in the Commons today. And finally, the Express sums it all up in two words, the survivor, they say, of the Chancellor. Well, that's all we have time for tonight. Jeremy will be back with an hour-long budget special on Newsnight tomorrow night. Until then, from all of us here, have a very good night. Mm -hmm.